I can start. Um, so just quickly, well, for me to have a brand is uh, like have something that helps people to remember you and remember what's um, your causes. Yeah. Um, also, for example, I think um, when you have a brand, people, um, you don't need to remember people what are the things that you can help with or you can, um, or are of your interest because they will, they will know. They will know because they already see every time that they see a topic that you are related to, they will see your face or they will think of you uh, at some point. And I think that's a very kind of a uh, quick way to, to say. Okay, should I go? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, so I think for me, it's a it's it's very similar to what Gretchen said. It's it's about figuring out what it is that makes you unique, um, even within your cohort, even within your field, and using that to your advantage uh, to uh, sort of label yourself. Um, you you deciding how others are going to perceive you or um, remember you. In, in, in to use Gretchen's words. Um, I think in my case, um, and I know we're not there yet, but I think in my case, um, I've, I've gone through several of these um, because of different being at different stages or different points. Um, but I think now people associate me with being a science diplomat, um, and that's a brand. Um, but some people associate me with being Oh, that's that Latina in STEM. And that's another brand. Um, and all of those are completely fine with me, but, but they, you know, they're, they're different ways of thinking about what I do that makes me unique and people remember. Thank you, Francis. So I want to bring Ron into the conversation. He had a little issue connecting, but he's with us. So thank you, Ron, for joining us. So we are, we're starting discussing, we're talking about branding, personal branding, marketing ourselves. Um, so the, the question is, you know, what does it mean to, to brand yourself, to market yourself? Ron? Yeah, first of all, Emma, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, and second of all, I sincerely apologize to everyone for not being able to join on time and I ran around and finally got a computer that worked. So anyway, I'm borrowing someone else's computer. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think the, well, I just heard, I only heard the last comment about, you know, defining something that's kind of unique about you. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, that, that kind of defines what kind of jobs you might want to apply for in the first place. Um, but yeah, I think if you're applying for an academic job or something, I think people are looking for, you know, kind of a unique research program, or if you're applying for an educational job, they're, uh, you know, looking for some, you know, skill set. So I think being very clear about you know what kind of uh, you know what kind of things that are exciting about your experiences and your passions too. I think people want to hire uh, people that are going to be passionate about whatever job they have. You know, it's not just about getting a job and a salary. They want to find someone who's going to be uh, really excited to join that group. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually going to put you on the spot because um, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, but I, I think I feel, and actually I think I know that a lot of scientists feel really uncomfortable with the idea of branding themselves and having to market themselves, but something that you just brought up is that, you know, what the research and the work that you're doing and what you're passionate about is, is part of, of your brand. And, you know, I think in, in your case, you know, it's Kinesin. Um, for examples, and so that's, you know, your research is broader than that, but when we talk, when, when I know when I talk to people about Ron Vale and I say, oh, Kinesian, immediately people make 
the the connection. And so can you talk from from your perspective as a researcher, like how do you go about building that research brand? And how is it is it different from your brand as an individual? Or do they go together? Well, I guess I would say, first of all, I mean, that's a good case where the brand is limiting. So I wouldn't uh, say that, you know, that's a case where, well, I'd like to think of myself as broader and my life as more multidimensional than just Kinesin. So that's actually, you know, in some cases, something that one has to actively sometimes prevent because it kind of defines a niche that doesn't allow you to grow in new and interesting ways with your research and and uh, or you know if you get a job at a company you don't want to be necessarily so super branded that you're identified with you know a narrow job niche you really want to i think sometimes market yourself as someone that can take on a lots of different, you know, kinds of abilities um, and, you know, move into new research areas or take on new jobs as a company. So, I don't know, maybe I'll push back on that a little bit that, um, yeah, you, you want to be known for having done something, but you also want to be known as someone who is talented, curious, uh, multi-dimensional and able to take on anything that comes your way you know that as your job changes and grows and you go into new areas that you can meet those challenges because I think whatever companies or universities also that's the person they want you know they want someone who is going to uh, be kind of smart enough interested enough to meet new challenges when they come along too that's excellent. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted you to push back. <laughs> okay. Francis or Gretchen, do you want to add anything? Not me. All right. Um, I think Francis, you alluded it to a, a little bit to this um, when you said, like, you know, people see us, see you as a science diplomat, and then, but they some people also see you as as um, as a Latina in in STEM, and you know, there's people are multidimensional. They have all these different identities. They have all these. They wear all these multiple hats. So it is really important that you think about. You're strategic about how you're gonna present yourself um, so that people see all those multiple dimensions and the values that all of those different dimensions bring to the table regardless to what table you're, you're, coming, um, to, you're coming to. And so talking about strategies, you know, our fellows are, and, and I know that a lot of people are probably gonna be watching this video after the fact, are graduate students, they're young scientists. And so when you're at that stage, it's really easy to think about your brand. You know, I'm a graduate student, I'm a postdoc, I'm a young scientist, and this is, you know, I use these techniques or I do this kind of work. But when you're thinking about those multiple dimensions, were there steps that you took early on in your career to start, kind of start creating that brand that or that person that you wanted people to know what are some of the strategies that you used so I can say that I don't think I did this early on that's saying that I did this early on in my career is probably way too early for when I really caught on to what was happening um, you know a lot of people say you should develop your elevator pitch um, you should um, be able to tell somebody in 30 seconds what it is that you do and, and what it is that you want. And that's a good exercise. Um, but I would also, it is, I think I did it later on. Um, and it was when I, it started dawning on me that, that I had a unique set of characteristics that could potentially work in my favor. Um, I am broader than that definition. Um, but the truth is that people have a very short attention span and 
being able to capture, depending on the audience, things in, in some sound bites that work for that environment can be very useful in terms of getting your message across. Um, so, you know, I, I eventually, I figured, when I figured it out, then I started to deliberately use it. Um, and so I guess that's why we're here, so that you will deliberately use these things earlier than we did, right? Or, or much earlier than when we figured it out. Um, when did I use it? When I figured it out, when did I start using it? When I picked a Twitter account and my description under my Twitter handle, you know, I, I, I used the things that, the three things that I thought would make me stand out, you know, um, science diplomat, um, catalyzer of Puerto Rican diaspora, and one other thing, which to me capture maybe three things that are part of that uh, smorgasbord of, of talents and things that I do. Um, and so, so that's it. I, I, I think that the idea is why do I do that? Because I think it's easier for people to digest what I do and think of me faster when they are thinking, you know, what, why, why? Because I want when a position opens up or when a, an opportunity for a speaking engagement happens, I want to be on that first list of 10 people that they think about when they think of those people that represent a particular field, expertise, et cetera and slowly branching out from that to expand, right? So I know that I can speak to a lot more than um, international affairs. I can speak to innovation and international affairs. So how do you start, you know, kind of broadening that out? Because I certainly don't want to be known as just the Puerto Rican scientist who works at the State Department on International Affairs, um, like Ron said, um, but I have used it and leveraged it to get to other points. Can I add something? Yeah. So in my case, it was um, very similar because it was not early. Um, I think in so somehow when I was doing the PhD, um, I got my a little kind of brand because people started to recognize what was my work about, especially in the at the level of the university, the department. You know, this is the girl who wore with this or this or this. Especially in the case because. Um, I was a good speaker, and then uh, they always, I make sure they understand my research so hard that I think that's why they probably remember a lot, because my presentations honestly were pretty good. So then, uh, you know, they, they, they recognize that, so they remember, and I think that helps, and that's part of the importance of the uh, communication skills, right? It helps with the brand a lot. Um, but that was not conscious. It was kind of like my personality, the, you know, the way I work. But then um, by, when I was doing my PhD, I started also with uh, Ciencia Puerto Rico. And then at that moment, when you have a cause, and that moment when I have a cause, which is to advance science, to communicate science, then I started to do more in purpose because I have different stories that I think people can connect with me and use that uh, for that cause and use that in benefit of, of the organization or in benefit of a, a message, right? Uh, for instance, was just um, how to communicate science. And then I started to um, try to do it, right? And then uh, try to tell people, I can do this, you can do this too, and so on. And later on was, uh, as Frances mentioned, like uh, Latinos, uh, scientists, right? Puerto Rican scientists and, and uh, uh, relevant science for uh, Hispanics. And then later on was women in science, you know? So it, it was kind of a, like um, in different stages according to the message that I want to transmit at that um, moment. And that was very conscious. That was different to, to uh, my research at the beginning because uh, that was a passion, right? And it makes a difference. I mean, my research was is a, is a passion, but at that moment, I saw that more, um, like, like now, we are trying them to think about this. I didn't think about that before until I got into Ciencia Puerto Rico, right? Um, uh, I guess that if I knew that earlier, maybe I would market me better <laughs> for my research at some point. Um, but in my case, it was kind of late, not conscious, and then very conscious for uh, other roles in my career.
I think it'd be interesting to hear Ron's take on this as well, Monica, um, mm -hmm. about when, Ron, when did you start thinking more consciously about the name you were making or had made for yourself and how that impacted, you know, what invitations you got to conferences or how people were talking about your work? Well, I mean, to be honest, like I'm a bad case study, right? I mean, like, I was marketing myself for jobs all, <laughs> a long time ago uh, in a very, very different world. Um, you know, which is totally different now and no social media, none of, you know, even the tools of marketing that are present today. I mean, I think the example is not so much pertinent from where I stand. It's more like how I have to help people in my lab. I, I don't, in some ways I've got a job. So I, you know, I'm not like desperate to market myself to get a job. Um, but I, you know, my position is, which, you know, many of you are going to be in as well. I mean, right now you may be looking in positions, but it transitions very quickly to you being a mentor and thinking about other people's position in the world. Um, in which case you have to strategize to help them because that's your goal as a mentor, right? So, um, yeah, so my situation, reality is not so much me marketing myself. It's really thinking about graduate students and postdocs coming through my group. And, you know, my general view is my success as a scientist is not papers or things like that. It's really making sure that everyone that comes through my group you know, kind of achieves uh, the, the next position that they want, you know, that they are happy with. Um, and that's my responsibility. And if I don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean that person has to be like an esteemed professor at esteemed institution. It just means that, you know, person X that I take into my family, which is my lab, that's my family. Uh, you know, that they go somewhere where they're happy, you know, and, um, and, you know, it's not trivial to do that. So, but I, I feel it's like my job to do that. So how do I do that? Well, um, you know, I guess, I mean, part of it is giving people, helping them with the skills that they need to do it. It's not just about marketing. It's also about, learning how to communicate effectively, whether it's written form, if you have to write a letter, if you have to write an email, you sometimes you only get one shot at it, right? If you're gonna give a job talk, you get one shot at it, at that place, right? So uh, I, you, you know, so how you communicate is so important in getting people to listen to you and making that effective first impression um, so yeah, I would say my, most of my guidance comes in really thinking that through with them as well as also trying to help them decide what they want to do with their lives. You know, what makes them happy? What's their aspiration? Where do they want to be? And, uh, encouraging them to dream a little bit, even sometimes, um, how do I say it? You know, thinking bigger than sometimes they sometimes think you know because sometimes people can reach a little farther than they think they than the, that they can and more often than not they get there so uh you know i'm a cheerleader i guess and a mentor and um that's my main job that's great and actually that's a great uh lead into a question that we have and uh, from ariel ariel do you want to go ahead and ask your question sure can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of in the academic scene, uh, I was saying before commenting that in terms of researchers, people get to identify you based on like the techniques that you master in your lab and uh, like what you publish with, which is a good thing, but can, but can also be kind of a source of critique. Like that, that lab only does that kind of technique and they don't uh, expand upon that. They publish well, but they don't do anything else. But um, now talking about mentors, like how do you brand yourself as a particular mentoring style that you have in the academic, in the academic setting? 
and how important is that? Who is that question for? I think for you. <laughs> oh, for okay. Well, you're you're the one who's uh, you know a PI in academia. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but you know the others can comment later. Right. I guess there were two questions there. I mean, one is um, uh, about you know not getting over identified with a technique, or uh, but the second question was how do you make yourself uh, known as a good mentor, I guess, and make that more broadly known. Um, you know, I guess the real way to think about it is very, very simple. You know, if people leave your group and they're happy and they have good things to say about their experiences and they write to you later because they value your advice and they want to stay in contact with you even though they don't have to. Um, you know, th those are some good metrics, I guess, of, um, you know, being a good mentor. And, you know, I would say also the value for really, you know, trying to do that. I'm just trying to, you know, I'll just tell you one story. There was, um, you know, a endowed kind of honorific lecture for scientists that passed away here at, at the MBL and a lot of um, a lot of former students and you know postdocs came in that room and a lot of cases they couldn't even remember like the exact work that made this individual so famous but what they what really stood out after a whole career was the fact that there were a whole group of people that came through this lab that ended up with some kind of joy and excitement of science, which was, I would say, a greater legacy for this individual than any single paper produced by, uh, you know, uh, the scientists. What this person, you know, you really was remembered for was actually someone who ended up, you know, being really fondly remembered as a fantastic mentor. And I think looking back on a life, that's what you want. I mean, when you're whatever, 70 years old or whatever, what do you want to be known for? Are you going to be known for that one paper that you struggle with? Or are you going to want to be known for being kind, respectful, and encouraging of a whole bunch of people that you've interacted with throughout your life. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of these are not super quantitative, but I, I, think, um, I think just taking the first step of wanting to be a good mentor, that that's even more important than just producing your next paper, that's a big step forward. Yeah, can I add something uh, quickly? Yeah. Uh, in that same line that uh, Ron was talking about metrics, I, I want to uh, tell you a short story that I think is as evidence that could be something that you can count. For example, uh, my mentor as a PhD, in the PhD, uh, Dr. Anita Hopper, um, I had the experience to have, um, just before I came to Puerto Rico, um, I was doing my uh, postdoc in Nebraska, um, we had this uh, meeting at Ohio State that was uh, Anita's Fest. And it was a celebration of her uh, research, right? And also uh, her career. And there, there was a lot of colleagues uh, that went there to give talks about their research, but always connecting in somehow how they relate to Anita. And the rest of the audience was their, um, her grad students, her students from many, 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 many years. And I think when you see something like that, it's just like, it's just like tells you how good researcher and mentor a person can be. I don't say that if you don't have a fest, it's not, you're not a good mentor. But I mean that it really means something when people gather together to celebrate you, right? Um, at some point of your career. And I think if you're a good mentor, and you have students that will go out and talk about you, that's the tool that you, your better tool for, for your marketing as a good mentor. That's it. Uh, 
That's awesome. Frances, do you have any, any experience with uh, that you want to share from um, your days in uh, science with um, seeing people's brands, um, either as mentors or um, as scientists? Um, I think it's interesting because what I remember from grad school, there were people that had terrible brands and people that had great brands, right? There was the PI that you should never work for because they were known for making people cry or known for expecting people to be in the lab 24 hours a day on Saturday and Sunday. And then there was the PI that was so hands off and nobody got anything done. Um, I think I had a PI that was, very kind and very understanding of people's weaknesses and strengths. And that's what I clearly remember about her branding. Everybody would say, oh, Susan's wonderful. That wonderful, where'd that wonderful come from? And, and I, my proof of Susan being wonderful was that I was very engaged throughout grad school in a lot of things in the community. A lot of my advocacy part comes from those days. That's how I ended up in policy. And I remember one day walking into the lab and on my desk was the announcement for the call for applications for the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And then Susan's writing was, I saw this and it is so you, you must apply. And Susan. And what PI at that time in history, <laughs> it was like 2002 maybe, would have done that I thought that that was a particular, to me, that's my vision of her. She later went on to become Dean for Academic Affairs and a, a bunch of other things, which I think speaks to that branding she created around being able to understand different styles, different strengths, and being able to, you know, I still go back to her lab and talk to her students, and she has no problem with me talking about a non-academic career in science. In fact, she does everything she can to provide opportunities for the graduate student audience to hear about many different types of careers. And to me, that's a brand, you know, um, seeing a, a PI that, or a researcher that can see science for all of its different facets and, and what it can be. Um, and I, I think that's a, a less, I, I think that's an essential lesson in branding. Um, I think Ron talked about this too. Um, you're not just a molecular biologist. You're not just a spiner. I'm looking at the chat. You're not just whatever it is that, that you can kind of narrowly think. I was a developmental neurobiologist, but I was a problem solver. And I was a summer STEM summer camp counselor in the summers. And I was also a mentor to undergrads. And I was also all these things. Um, that I think we are not taught or guided enough to be able to talk about those broad set of skills. Um, I had a phone call today with a young woman who is working at Google and she's working on Google's team of risk assessment and she's a molecular biologist. And she said that one of her biggest challenges when she came to Google was explaining to people what a molecular biologist was doing at Google, doing risk assessments. And we talked through it because she was already there. It wasn't that she was convincing Google that she needed, she got the job, but she was still encountering that when she was talking to people, she was having a hard time saying something that wasn't, my name is Lisette and I am a molecular biologist. Um, here she is at Google, here she is doing risk assessments. She's in one of the coolest places on earth right now. And she's having trouble explaining her set of skills. And so we talked through it and we, towards the end of the conversation, we came up with what would it mean if you took molecular biology completely out and substituted it with a set of functions? You are a, an analytical thinker, problem solver. What if you said, my name is Lisette and I find solutions? to your pain points. What if you said, you know, I am a researcher of how to make things fail 
less spectacularly for Google. You know, that this is, this, none of this makes her not a molecular biologist, but it is how you can take the, the very essence of, of what you do and what you're very good at and what you do every day and you peel away all those layers. And what is it that you do? If you would have asked me when I was in grad school, I killed rats every Wednesday. And then I extracted all of their intestines and I pulled out all the enteric neurons and then I was doing tissue culture. And But what I did was much broader than that. I was a strategic thinker. I encountered problems every day in my research that made me have to redirect my research question. That is developing a strategy. People kill and pay thousands of dollars for consultants to strategize solutions for their next move and, and then the reorg of their organization or whatever. Scientists do this every day, yet we go out there and say, I'm a molecular biologist. I'm done. That's my soapbox. <laughs> That's, that was awesome. And that actually, that relates very directly to an experience I've, I had recently at the Aspen Ideas Festival. I was introducing myself and I would say, I am a scientist doing science education or whatever. And, you know, the first, I maybe like a third word that came out of my mouth was I am a scientist and people, that was what people focused on. Yours. What kind of scientist, what kind of science did you do? What did you train on? And I was like, that's not the point. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how I'm using technology to transform science education. Who cares about I'm a scientist, but that, that was what people were focusing on because Somebody once told me that your brand is, it's the promise that you make people about who you are. And so as soon as I said scientist, people made all of these connections and they wanted to ask me about, oh, what do you think about artificial intelligence? Or what do you think about, you know, whatever science topic and why? Because the brand of what a scientist is means something to people and I didn't realize that at first and it was very frustrating because I was like, no, 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 you're going the wrong way. But as I kept talking to people, I realized why does this keep happening? Because people associated that word with, with, you know, the things that they thought I could do or the knowledge they thought I possessed. Um, So it's really interesting that you bring that up. And actually that takes me into the next question that I wanted to ask and is about how do we brand a scientist, you know, how do you brand yourself outside of, um, of academia? You know, we often, the majority of the fellows are, you know, are still training and they're thinking about academic careers. And, you know, I think it's a little bit easier to think about how you brand yourself using your research or the kind of work that you're doing. But even outside of academia, even if you're still uh, a researcher, but if you go outside the ivory tower, you know, how do you use what being a scientist means to brand yourself and leverage that brand outside of academia? Sorry, you want me to start? Okay. Um, so um, I'm not afraid of any social media platform in this world. I don't use all of them, but um, I see many people scare about this and I, I don't know if someday something will happen, but I use them a lot, especially Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook in different ways um, to, for branding. But um, I think that they're great tools if you use how to use them. So I don't think there's a reason you have to be that scared because there's many other ways that you can um, get, you know, people can get your information that is not a social network platform. So in these days, right? Um, And what I do is that um, I usually um, try to use my stories as something, try to catch people with something that they can relate to, right? Um, For example, in the moment that I want to talk about women in science, I don't talk about my research in spindle body. I talk about my experiences as a woman in a lab or as a woman when I went to these many uh, cell biology meetings where, um, for example, I was the only Latina in the, in the meeting. And then I use those things because I think many other Latina scientists can identify with that. 
And then they get the message and they get stuck there and then you can be a role model and then they will remember you because you are that Latina that talk about that experience before, you know. Um, one thing that I do is that, um, I, I don't remember if it was a, like a year ago, but I started my own uh, Facebook page uh, where I put all my science things uh, separate from the personal uh, uh, page. Um, and it was because um, sometimes I feel like there's many people, they really, uh, don't want to receive some kind of messages, but I still do it. I just CC my Gretchen Diaz to my personal one. But what I do is that I collect intentionally uh, photos and I use those albums as a tool. Actually, it's not just an album. I use them as a tool. So people who want to know what I do uh, at the uh, Puerto Rican Science Trust or uh, if they wanted to know what I do with Ciencia PR, they are separate. So they can go directly to those pictures and see exactly what I'm doing. And there's no confusion. So they, they will see the different, um, I would say, personalities that I have and the different things that I can do. And I think at, at this point that helped me a lot because I think people I mean, when they remember me, they remember different topics, they think I can do a lot of different things. And I think that's a broader way of, you know, the branding. Like, if they really think you're a multitasker, you're a doer, right? That you're a person that can execute. And I, I like that kind of brand. Independently of what topic it is, I think they think. And I heard many things that I think I don't deserve. But they think about that because it's just what they, you know, what I'm projecting and trying to project. Um, that if you want, you can do many, many things, and there's many options to help or many options to impact people. If you don't like this one that I do, I'll give you another option. And, and that's the way that I use uh, social networks as a tool for branding. Ron or Francis? I can go, can you repeat again? It, it was how do you use branding? What was it outside of academia? Yeah, so how do you, even if you're still in academia or regardless of, of you know, what your career is, how do you leverage that brand of I am a scientist beyond academia? So I think the way that it works in your favor is that there is there are stereotypes that surround being a scientist, right? And one stereotype is that you're really smart. And that's a great uh, branding tool, right? Um, so, and of course you are smart. It's not a stereotype. You, you are very, very smart. It's not just a thing, pe a thing people think about you. Um, but in my uh, line of work, I, I am surrounded daily with many more people that have PhDs in political science. Um, they're experts in international affairs, foreign service, um, and at some point, I became known as La Doctora. Even for Americans that know me as Francis, they still see me in the hall as, Doctora, how are you? Blah, 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 blah. And that became a thing because I was a scientist that was sitting in on meetings that were, um, mainly uh, geopolitical affairs focused, right? It was a meeting on, let's take a random example, um, Iran nuclear deal, right? It, it, there's a big thing happening. You're gonna, we're gonna have this new deal with Iran. Um, and, but there's a lot that's gonna happen on the science side, right? Even post the nuclear deal, when we talk about these things, what, what happens to the sciences that were doing this work? What happens to the facilities where this work was happening? There was a lot of science happening. Um, so I am that person in the room that it may not be an expert on Iranian affairs or an expert on energy in particular, but I'm, I'm an expert on what scientists can do with their skills um, once they are not doing something and I have to do something new, or I'm an expert on mobility of scientific talent and so I'm la doctora, uh, which is sort of, in a, in a way, I've played up for them um, what I do. Um, 
And the reason I do that is because how relevant your knowledge is and how you're able to frame it for people is how much you will be sought after and how you will land that job. I can sit there and say, well, this isn't developmental neurobiology, so I'm not going to speak. But I know about a lot more than just developmental neurobiology. I know, again, about problem solving. I know about academic careers. I know about mobility of scientists. I know about you know policy versus private sector versus academic settings. So if you ask me, what could a scientist do that wasn't working in a government lab on nuclear energy if that goes away? What could a scientist that does that do? I could probably come up with like 10 things that that person can do. And I didn't, that's not what I got my PhD in, but I am using my knowledge in a, in a non-academic setting to make it applicable. Um, and so I think that the full set of your skills is what branding outside of academia means. It is framing who you are for a broader audience than your neuroscience, developmental neuroscience audience. Um, because at the end of the day, I feel whether you are in academia or policy or private sector, one thing that all scientists have in common is that they want to make a difference. They want to discover something. They want to leave a legacy. They want to have had a body of work that makes a difference. And that body of work can be influencing students, changing departments, having a breakthrough. It can be changing the whole strategy for graduate student recruitment, whatever that legacy is, which can be very broad, um, comes from being able to frame your talents for a diverse audience. That's awesome. Ron, if I can put you on the spot, how do you, you know, you do more than your research, you know, you do you're very involved with iBiology, you're very involved with various um, outreach, communication, education, publishing initiatives. Um, can you speak to how you use this as the, you know, the researcher in, in the room who, and how you brand yourself outside of academia? Well, before I, can I just comment on something that Francis said? Because yeah. you know, it was really good and resonates with me that you know, scientists are problem solvers. Um, I wish the general public understood that. Uh, we would have much easier time you know, branding ourselves. I mean, the, the two things that we take really for granted at, is that we are problem solvers. Um, so I agree with Francis the way she put that. Second thing is um, we know how to evaluate evidence and respond to it in a thoughtful way. Now, we just take that for granted because it's kind of embedded in our DNA. But if you look at a lot of businesses or, you know, the general populace, you know, thoughtful evaluation of evidence and data is unfortunately a lot rarer than it, you know, it's, it's a rare commodity, actually. Um, so, you know, maybe in some ways it would, it would be great if the general public understood more about what we do um, and that our, you know, skill sets are more multidimensional, um, that it's cool learning science for a lot of reasons. You know, it's, it's not this nerdy very narrow restricted enterprise done by bald men with no social life as uh, I'm, I'm the poster child of that. Um, but uh, anyway, um, it would, you know, and I think the physics community has done a better job branding themselves because right now, Physicists are being, there are no jobs for them, first of all, that's a problem, but they're being scooped up by like the financial and business sector, like wholesale. And I think it's because of this perception, well, not perception, but you know, they've been trained in quantitative skills and can be retrained in other industries like the financial industry based upon that. 
And um, so they, as a community, have done a pretty good job branding themselves. And I wish biologists, you know, we could kind of get that across that just like that, you know, we have skill sets can be retrained in a whole bunch of different areas. Um, so anyway, that was the main point I want to make relative to the last conversation. Regarding the other thing, I don't know. I really don't like to spend a lot of time thinking of branding myself, actually. Uh, maybe that's just me. I just rather get the job done and accomplish something rather than, you know, brand myself with some project. Uh, I, you know, I get more gratification of just seeing an outcome. Uh, and in many cases, if that outcome is even more visibly shared by many people and many people are seen as responsible for it, that is a bigger success. But I'm a terrible brander in some ways for, <laughs> for some things, but I have no problem branding a project. I think branding a project, especially at the stage of my career right now, like I said earlier, I don't really need to brand myself. I got a job. So, um, much more concerned about branding and effort if that branding of the effort is actually going to do some public good. Um, so some cases you have to do that as well, not just brand yourself, but brand actually what you are trying to accomplish. So that's a whole other element of branding, but important consideration. Can I say something? So this weekend I was in a a workshop where there were a lot of young scientists and it was about professional development and um, they had to do the two minute elevator pitch that you all went through. Um, and one thing I noticed was that a lot of them were talking about what they had done um, as kind of, I think, evidence of what they were interested in, but very few of them actually talked about what they were interested in. Um, so I think that, you know, that's a good starting point for a lot of you. You all have very strong interests in science. Um, and so that's part of your identity as a scientist. You know, the work that Gabriel does or what he's interested in is very different from what Ivelisse is interested in. And that defines who you are as scientists. So that's, I think that's a good starting point. Um, but I think we had a lot of um, questions on the chat. So um, uh, let's see. Monica, did you notice which one was first? Yeah, so we've had a few. Um, uh, Ivelisse, you had a question about um, the hardest part of marketing yourself. Do you want to go ahead and, and talk about that? Yes, um, hi. I was uh, wondering what was the hardest part um, when when it comes to marketing yourself, and I, I I think it comes and it happens more often when you're halfway through your grad school or almost graduating, and you have to figure out what you want to do next because you don't want to do a step that then is wrong, and, and you're like, oh, so what I'm gonna do now, and feel like going anywhere. So I was just wondering, what was that thing that you consider was hard to go over? and you know like jump that hurdle and then go to the career that you you are in on the or then make a switch and finally end up when you wanted to be um, any of the three i i answered <laughs> on the chat but i'm happy to um I, I think the hardest part is getting over the thought that you are that one issue person um, that you are an expert on, I don't know, uh, CRISPR Cas9, and that is the only thing that you know in the world. Um, and to be able to think of yourself more broadly as a person who is a DNA person, a person who is a biologist, and how you can take steps outside of that too sort of see yourself in many different lights that don't actually change the essence of your knowledge and, and what you bring to the table, but that it puts it in the frame of a broader set of skills. I think we sort of have imposter syndrome a little bit that that's the only thing we can do or we're good at. Um, 
But I have to say, I think the, the, the job market has changed a lot. And maybe Ron can speak to this. I, I've been out of academia for a while, but I get the sense that academia is starting to evolve to the point of view that having a cross-disciplinary set of skills is okay. And that, you know, you can be the CRISPR-Cas9 person that develops a business strategy to launch a new product for modifying crops in agriculture. And you would, you know, and so that's, so, and, and, and I totally need Ron to jump in on this because I'm, I, that's my perception from what I see coming out of universities uh, now um, that the, the job market is changing in a way that scientists bring a lot, but that the market is willing to take a scientist that's willing to get read up really fast on investing in technologies with CRISPR-Cas9 and bringing their expertise, being part of a team. Like a scientist can leave a laboratory at MIT and go work with a team at an investment fund that is looking at how to invest in gene editing technologies. And then, and they would be collaborating at a table with a lawyer, a scientist, and an investment person. And so I, I feel that the, the, the market has changed and is changing very rapidly um, for the variety of things that scientists can do. They don't stop being scientists, they contribute their expertise, but now they do it in a setting where um, things are rapidly evolving. But I, Ron, you can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll agree with you. Uh, also, you know, with a simple statement that I think everyone can relate to, and that is, I'll, I'll, I'm speaking just for academic job right now. Um, we can talk about others later, but just for academic job. I mean, it is pretty clear that whatever you're doing today to get your job or whatever you're working on as a postdoc is not what you're going to be doing 10 years from now. You know, science changes so fast that, which is the fun of it. I mean, it's, I would say the most fun thing about academics is you're not doing the same thing and there's really no other career that challenges you in, you know, evolving, I would say, over your career to follow problems. So, gosh, I mean, you know, like, if I tell you what I was doing as a graduate student, you know, you, everyone on this call would just say, wow, how prehistoric, you know. But, the, you know, the point is, uh, um, I think both the fun of academics is you're constantly changing what you're doing. I mean, you're not going to be doing CRISPR and Cas9 X for the next 40 years. So I think, I think getting an academic job is not that big of a mystery. Uh, I think people are just looking for good people, like good, smart, adaptable, scientists who are going to have a career and um, uh, change. So I think marketing yourself, I, I, first of all, I don't think academic places are looking for that. You know, like looking for the person that can do X very specifically because that's not the nature of an academic job. Now that is more true in industry, I would say, than academics because there are many cases where you get a job in industry and they are looking for someone who can run high throughput, uh, you know, sell culture screens and that's the entry to get that job. Now, the good news is once you're there at that company that if you're good, that need not be what you're going to do for the rest of your life. But that's their mentality. I think when they're looking to hire someone, that is not the mentality in an academic job. They're looking you know, more for the features that you just mentioned, which is, you know, adaptability, flexibility, you know, broad skills, broad thinking. Great, thank you. Um, so we have some more questions from the chat. Um, Gabriel, do you wanna ask your question from a little bit ago about steps that you can ta take? Yes. Um, what? Uh, oh, okay. So I guess what I was commenting on the 
chat was that um, I feel like I don't have a clear idea of what I want and where do I want to go. And I know you've been talking about to define yourself, but I feel like you have to have some sort of general idea of, of that. And I feel, I think, I don't know if this happens to many people as well. I don't, but at least that's how I, I feel myself. And I have, that's sort of what Ivelisse was talking about. That was like that fear of choosing something and then regretting it and losing time. And in the world that we live is like every, like the people who make it to the top usually are people that have, you know, every step was like, you know perfectly they they did all the right things and they accomplished all the right stuff because everything takes time in order to get to that point and nobody want to lose uh, years so that was sort of why i was sort of have that fe fear of committing to something that i'm not sure about so i was my question was that what baby steps can i take to figure out how to define myself and set up like a direction to that would be to my benefit as a, as a brand. I would like to jump on that, especially because of, of what you said right now about the steps and about uh, um, being, um, have a perfect pathway, which is mostly what uh, don't happen to most people. Most people don't have a perfect pathway. And many successful people have actually very bizarre pathway, if you want to call like that, okay? Because that's, I, I think, subjective. But I will give you my example for, um, I did a postdoc. Um, I don't really don't, I really don't need a postdoc for what I'm doing right now, right? Um, but that gave me a lot of experience um, exactly um, on what I'm doing. But, you know, for example, in my case, I wanted to be a fashion designer before and I left my bachelor degree in science to do my career in, in design. And then I went back because at some point I learned it. No, 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 no. This is not really what I want. So I went back and I finished my degree. And then I went and did a master and I did a PhD. So um, always when I talk to students, I show them exactly that because I want them to know that that happens. Uh, that is not what we want. But in the role, you learn a lot. The important thing is that what did you learn in all the pathways or all the, the segways that you have in your life, okay? So just wanna make clear that it's really not uh, a straightforward pathway for very successful people. And there's many uh, hidden stories because usually what CVs makes you to do is to tell the successful stories of your lives. But how many grants did you wrote that were rejected? How many papers did you wrote that were rejected? How many careers or you know things? Uh, you did not complete it are not in your CV, right? Usually. So, um, so just have that in mind. That's one thing. And the other thing um, I, I think I wrote in the chat is that what I did is to try different small things, you know? Um, I went to do my, my postdoc because I love research, but I was not sure that I really have to do a postdoc, but I really like it and I did it, right? And while I was doing that, I was also continuing my volunteer work at Ciencia PR. And there, inside of Ciencia PR, I was trying many different things that helped me in some, somehow to define what I like the most, okay? So I, I will say that in your very busy life as a graduate student, I know it's very difficult, but try to find a, a small uh, activities where you can involve. And then you will see that they will, with the time, you know, let you know what things you like and that could help you to define you um, later on. Maybe I can just add one comment and, you know, just to say that, you know, sometimes there are actually multiple, I mean, in our lives, we end up with some route that we go through life with. But, you know, I think in many cases, for many people, the, the dice could have been rolled another way and people would have been equally happy. You know, in other words, like, I think there's one view that there's only one job out there for me and I have to find it. Um, another view is that, well, I'm actually interested in a lot of things and, you know, I think I could be good at a lot of things and um, I have a lot of different interests and passions and 
there are actually a lot of jobs that I can do and a lot of different careers that will make me happy. And, you know, at some time you just have to kind of launch yourself in some, you know, direction and let the serendipity of life just partially take over. I mean, you have to know yourself well enough to know what you don't like, because that's not good. If you take, go down something with some hesitation in your heart that, you know, I, I don't think I really want this job. I don't think I really like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you have that really gut feeling, that's probably the wrong thing to do. But, but otherwise, if you just say, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I'm interested in, um, that can be a good attitude to life too. Um, and to some extent, you know, also your comment about, oh, these successful people, you know, took these very deliberate paths in their life. I, I am not so sure about that statement. I think probably if you look at a lot of, you know, successful people and dissect their life, I don't think it's these carefully staged plans, strategic this or that. Yeah, they may have been success. They may be very successful now, but how they got there may have been very circuitous. So I think it's also just making the best of where you are and, um, uh, you know, making sure that you're happy. And I, I think basically if you're in, like, for example, I think if someone, if I was fired tomorrow, which I don't think will happen, and I have to market myself, I have to go into some different career, it wouldn't be the end of my life. I can imagine myself doing lots of different kinds of jobs um, as long as I could use my brain a little bit in my work. And I think I could be happy doing that. I, I agree with that. I think I'll, I'll jump in and say that I, I think most people's career paths are actually a jungle gym of different routes that you, and, and I think you take anybody, Elon Musk, if you've read his biography, it'll blow you away. Um, the paths he took, there was certainly nothing laid out about what he, the way he got to where he is right now. And I think for most people, it's like that. I think that I agree so much with what Ron said about, I think I could do anything. I, I, I really do. And you know, my latest thing is I've become really, really interested in understanding social impact investing um, from a scientific point of view. How do you get these people with all these, with all these funds and money to really throw money at amazing science and technology ideas that the NSF or NIH might not be funding um, or that might be too risky, but, or that nobody may know about or that isn't happening necessarily at a university. And so, you know, but I'm trained as a scientist and so I know very little about investing. Um, and so now my thing is I'm sitting on a board of an investment fund as the only scientist on there because I want to learn that because I think I could do this. And trust me, I am not the best person um, with finances. My husband would tell you that any day. Um, but here I am. I'm talking about funds and returns and, and, and I'm loving how it's expanding my thinking and it's science. I am thinking about it completely from the science point of view and it's completely different. And I know that if I left my job today, I could potentially go advise an investment fund on the scientific areas that they need to look at and like, tease those apart because it's exactly what Ron said. I see myself, I could actually do um, analysis of evidence and translation of that for others. Um, from the idea of how can we invest more for a bigger impact on humanity. And so that's something that now is sort of another turn that I see happening in the road. Um, but I'm loving it and embracing it and thinking, who knows what I'll fall in love with next. And it requires energy and, and, and learning it, but totally capable of doing that as are any of you of doing any other quick turn in the road and some amazing opportunity using your skill set. You will not fail. And if you do, 
fail fast and fail often and get back on the horse because I can tell you, those of you that try different things and are able to get back up, that is the candidate that, that will be most attractive in today's world, the one that is able to rebuild, get back up, and can think of everything as lessons learned and a rerouter. Be like a GPS. How do I reroute immediately? I was just typing in the chat that uh, if you guys remember from the chat on non-academic career tracks, Rudy Bellani, who was talking about how to make the transition, he said, it's not about transferable skills. Scientists are transferable people. Because you've all had to learn, you know, what you're experts in now, pretty much from scratch. Um, so, you know, that's who we are. We're professional learners. That's what we can do the best, is learn something really quickly and apply our brains to solving new problems. Yeah, and if, you know, if you're aware of the things that you know and the things that you're, you're passionate about, and so as you go along in your career and as, as you mature and you get to know yourself better, then it becomes easier. You start training your eye, basically. You know, there's some opportunities that are, they're not going to come up and fall in your lap and it's going to be immediately obvious what you can do with them and if you can pivot and take them and run. But you start training yourself and you become more strategic in, in seeing and identifying opportunities that are going to allow you to to grow and to you know kind of add layers to and dimensions to who to who you are um so we have about seven minutes left in the conversation um and so do we have any burning questions i mean i could keep asking questions but um this chat is really for you so please go ahead you can raise your hand um if you have a question of or a comment or you can Type it in in the chat if you if you'd like. Um, so, who wants to be the lucky one? Maybe the last one. Come on. I want to say something while they ask. <laughs> uh, just quickly. I mean, if you don't if, think about if after this conversation. You still are having problems trying to find why you should market yourself. Um, in my case, uh, it was totally uh, crucial for having my job right now. Um, uh, I was uh, called one day by the trust because I, they know that I was in Puerto Rico and they know that I know about outreach, about these things, and that's how I got my job. The way I got my salary was doing my PhD, but the way I got my job was partly uh, my volunteer work in Ciencia PR and other activities that I did. And, and they knew that because of branding. And because also another tool for good branding is that you can manage your CV. I have like 10 different CVs, depending on who I want to, right? And the other thing is that I like my favorite quote uh, from Monica is uh, that if you care about science, you have to, uh, scientists has to be visible. And I think that for the good of science, we have to market uh, ourselves. We have to have a brand so we can impact more people and get more people interested in science and also uh, to advance uh, uh, science in general. Just that. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, do, is there anybody who wants to share their experience um, about branding? I mean, I know, I think I share what, what other um, panelists have said. Like I started branding myself and I, I didn't know that I was doing it, but once I became aware of how important it was and you know, I, people started telling me, you know, you're really good at this or people kept inviting me to give a particular kind of talk or talk about a particular topic. So that kind of started giving me hints of, oh, you know, this are some of the things that you do really well, or these are some of the things that people identify you with. Um, so is, are there any of you who you just realized, oh, I have been branding myself with regards to a particular passion I have and you didn't really notice it until 
we've, we're having this conversation? Nobody, really? No aha moments? Francisco. <laughs> You're just muted. Not me, not not me. Where's <laughs> where's uh, Will Marie? Okay. Hey, there she is. Marie, okay. There. So I have an example of a person in the group that I because I've I've recently been um, looking at some of what she's doing, who um, I think has been branding herself. Um, and to me, Will Marie is the graduate student that went to the COP the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change. And to me, that stands out about her because the COP is a place where negotiators and people that, you know, do work on climate change directly go, but it's usually, you know, experts or lobbyists and advocates. And, and for me, the fact that she was able to go to that and has used that to influence her research and her perspective really stands out. So recently I was asked if I knew of young people between 18 and 30 that ha that could be nominated to the United Nations new initiative on youth for the sustainable development goals. And I, it happened very quickly that while we were nominating people, Monica and I really thought, huh, sustainable development goals, environment and climate change, will marry. <laughs> because I, every time I, I've seen her and every time that I see one of her things, that presence of hers at the Conference of the Parties of Climate Change in Paris, which was one of, or, or maybe just before that, was stood out and it was a branding. And I don't think I know the details of everything she does in the lab, um, though I know they, have, they are of an environmental um, slant, but I know that this is, so I know you didn't speak for, your, I'm speaking for you, but to me, that's a very good example of branding. There you go. We'll put you on the spot with Mari. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Also, uh, a couple of days ago, I, what I was doing the, one of the recommended lectures, uh, readings, I asked to my lab mates or my friends like, what I'm good at it and then something that I didn't know uh, that, I, that I also do is also like planning speakers. So they said that I like to organize everything and, I, and everything goes well. So then that, that's something that they want me to continue doing. But I think that at some point you need also to decide what will be your priorities. For example, right now I'm coordinating a travel for everybody in my lab for a conference, but then I'm forget sometimes I'm forgetting that I need to do my research in business hours. So it's also a matter of what are the priorities. Sometimes you can do it uh, in your, like as a, as a hobby, but uh, I think that I need to be a little bit more careful uh, how to keep brand, uh, like branding myself. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ulmari. I think it's, it's really important also, you know, to think about how you use your volunteering, your extracurricular experiences to brand yourself. Um, you know, it's not just about you're an analytical thinker who can solve problems, but you can also manage projects. You can also strategize, you know, whatever it is that you do for volunteering. How do you bring that into the fold? I think that's something that is, um, that's really, really important to keep in mind when you're branding yourself. Because again, you, your brand is your whole self. Um, you know, there are some parts of your identity or what you do that are going to be particularly attractive to employers or collaborators or coworkers or whatever it is, but you know, you have to think about your, your whole self when you're, when you're branding yourself. And again, you know, it's that 
promise um, of, of who you are, what people are going to get if, you, if they bring you to the table, if they work with you, if they collaborate, um, if they mentor you. Um, so uh, with that, um, I want to be respectful of, of everybody's time. And so unfortunately, we don't have time for more. Um, this has been a great, great, great conversation. Thank you, Ron. Um, his final remark, he has to run, but his final remark is that you are positive, be positive. Um, and so, yeah, with that, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you so much, Ron, Francis, and Gretchen. For, for being with us and for sharing your, your insights and your experiences. And we'll see you on the next CLCNC Academy chat. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.